Kantavimuddhi, the ballad of liberation from the Kantas. Namato Sugata Sapanta Tamakantani. I pay homage to the one well gone, the foremost teacher, the Sakyan sage, the rightly self awakened one, and to the nine transcendent Tammas, and to the noble Sankha. I will now give a brief exposition of the Tammakantas, as far as I understand them. Once there was a man who loved himself and feared distress. He wanted happiness beyond the reach of danger, so he wandered endlessly. Wherever people said that happiness was found, he longed to go, but wandering took a long, long time. He was the sort of man who loved himself and really dreaded death. He truly wanted release from aging and mortality. Then. One day he came to know the truth, abandoning the cause of suffering and compounded things. He found a cave of wonders, of endless happiness, i.e. the body. As he gazed throughout the cave of wonders, his suffering was destroyed, his fears appeased. He gazed and gazed around the mountainside, experiencing unbounded peace. He feared if he were to go and tell his friends, they'd say he'd gone insane. He'd better stay alone, engaged in peace, abandoning his thoughts of contact, than to roam around a sycophant, both criticized and flattered, exasperated and annoyed. But then there was another man afraid of death, his heart all withered and discouraged. He came to me and spoke frankly in a pitiful way. He said, You've made an effort at your meditation for a long time now. Have you seen it yet, the true tamma of your dreams? Eh? How is it that he knows my mind? He asked to stay with me. So I agreed. I'll take you to a massive mountain with a cave of wonders, free from suffering and stress, mindfulness immersed in the body. You can view it at your leisure to cool your heart and end your troubles. This is the path of the noble lineage. It's up to you to go or not. I'm not deceiving or compelling you, just telling you the truth for what it is. And then I challenged him with riddles. First, what runs? What runs quickly is Vinyarna. Movements walking in a row, one after another. Not doubting that sanyas are right, the heart gets caught up in the running, back and forth. Sanyas grab hold of things outside and pull them in to fool the mind, making it think in confusion and go out searching, wandering, astray. They fool it with various tammas, like a mirage. What gains total release from the five kantas? The heart, of course, and the heart alone. It doesn't grasp or get entangled. No more poison of possessiveness, no more delusion. It stands alone. No sanyas can fool it into following along behind them. When they say there's death, what dies? Sankaras die, destroying their effects. What connects the mind into the cycle? The tricks of sanya make it spin. The mind goes wrong because it trusts its sanyas, attached to its likes, leaving this plane of being, going to that, wandering till it's dizzy, forgetting itself, completely obscure to itself. No matter how hard it tries to find the tamma, it can't catch a glimpse. What ferrets out the tamma? The heart ferrets it out, trying to find out how sanyas say good and grasp at bad and force it to fasten on loving and hating. To eat once and never look for more. The end of wanting to look, to know, to hope for knowing more. The end of entanglements. The mind sits still on its days, discarding its attachments. 
a four-sided pool brimming full. The end of desire, abandoning doubt, clean, without a moat, and danger-free. Sanyas settle out, sankaras don't disturb it. The heart is thus brimming, with nothing lacking, quiet and still. The mind has no lamenting thoughts, something worth admiring day after day. Even if one were to gain heavenly treasures by the millions, they'd be no match for the true knowing that abandons all sankaras. The crucial thing, the ending of desire. Labels stay in their own sphere and don't intrude. The mind, unenthralled with anything, stops its struggling. Like taking a mirror to look at your reflection, don't get attached to the sanyas, which are like the image. Don't get intoxicated with the issues of sankaras. When the heart moves, you can catch sight of the unadulterated heart. You know for sure that the movement is in yourself because it changes. Inconstancy is a feature of the heart itself. No need to criticize anyone else. You know the different sorts of kantas in the moving of the mind. Before, I used to think that sanyas were the heart, labeling outer and inner, which was why I was fooled. Now the heart's in charge, with no concerns, no hopes of relying on any one sanya at all. Whatever arises or passes away, there's no need to be possessive of sanyas or to try to prevent them. Like climbing to the top of a truly tall mountain and looking at the lowlands below, seeing every living being. Way up high, looking back, you see all your affairs from the very beginning, forming a path like stairs. Does the rise and fall of the river accord with the truth? You can't remedy the changing of sankaras. Fashioned by Gamma, they're out to spite no one. If you grasp hold of them to push them this way and that, the mind has to become defiled and wrong. Don't think of resisting the natural way of all things. Let good and evil follow their own affairs. We simply free ourselves. Unentangled in sankaras, that's what's peaceful and cool. When you know the truth, you have to let go of sankaras as soon as you see they're changing. When you weary of them, you let them go easily, with no need to be forced. The tamma is cooling. The mind will stop being subjected to things. The Five Duties Complete Kantas divide the issues of fashioning into five realms, each filled with its duties and affairs, with no room for any other, because their hands are full. No room even for fortune, status, praise, pleasure, loss of fortune, loss of status, criticism, pain. They let each of these follow its own nature, in line with its truth. The mind's not entangled with any of these eight because physical kantas keep creating aging and illness without pause. The mental kantas never rest. They work like motors because they must take on the gamma of what they have done. Good things make them enthralled and happy. Bad things agitate and darken the heart, making it think without stop as if it were a flame. The mind is defiled and dull. Its loves and hates are things it has thought up on its own, so who else can it blame? Do you want to escape aging and death? It's beyond the range of possibility, as when we want the mind to stop wandering around and thinking, when we want it to stay at one and hope to depend on its stillness. The mind is something that changes, totally uncertain. Zanyas stay in place only from time to time. Once we grow wise to the nature of all five kantas, the mind will be clear and clean, free from stain, with no more issues. If you can know in this way, it's superlative, because you see the truth, withdraw, and gain release. That's the end of the path. You don't resist the natural way of the truth of things. Poverty and wealth, good and bad, 
in line with events both within and without, all have to pass and vanish. You can't grasp hold of anything at which the mind takes aim. Now, when the mind's inconstant on its own, a quiver, quick, and you catch sight of it, that's when you find the ultimate in ease. Small things obscure our knowledge of the large. The kantas totally obscure the tamma, and that's where we go wrong. We waste our time in watching kantas so that we don't see the tamma that, though greater than the kantas, seems like dust. There is, there isn't, there isn't, yet there is. Here I'm totally stymied and can't figure it out. Please explain what it means. There is birth of various causes and effects, but they are not beings. They all pass away. This is clear, the meaning of the first point. There is, there isn't. The second point, there isn't, yet there is. This refers to the deep tamma, the end of all three levels of existence where there are no sankharas and yet there is the stable tamma. This is the singular tamma, truly solitary. The tamma is one and unchanging, excelling all being, extremely still. The object of the unmoving heart still and at respite, quiet and clear, no longer intoxicated, no longer feverish, its desires all uprooted, its uncertainties shed, its entanglement with the kantas all ended and appeased, the gears of the three levels of the cosmos all broken, overweening desire thrown away, its loves brought to an end, with no more possessiveness, all troubles cured as the heart had aspired. Please, explain the mind's path in yet another way, and the cause of suffering in the mind that obscures the tamma. The cause is enormous, but to put it briefly, it's the love that puts a squeeze on the heart, making it concerned for the khandhas. If the tamma is with the heart throughout time, that's the end of attachment, with no more cause for suffering. Remember this, it's the path of the mind. You won't have to wonder, spinning around till you're dizzy. The mind, when the tamma's not always with it, gets attached to its likes, concerned for the kantas, sunk in the cause of suffering. So, in brief, there's suffering, and there's the tamma always with the mind. Contemplate this until you see the truth, and the mind will be completely cool. However great the pleasure or pain, they'll cause you no fear. No longer drunk with the cause of suffering, the mind's well gone. Knowing just this much is enough to soothe your fevers, and to rest from your search for a path to release. The mind, knowing the tamma, forgets the mind attached to dust. The heart, knowing the tamma of ultimate ease, sees for sure that the kantas are always stressful. The tamma stays as the tamma, the kantas stay as kantas. That's all. And as for the phrase, cool, at ease, and freed from fever, this refers to the mind that's rescued itself from the addictive error of correcting other things. The Sankara aggregate offers no pleasure and truly is painful, for it has to age, grow ill, and die every day. When the mind knows the unexcelled tamma, it extracts itself from its defiling error that aggravates disease. This error is a fierce fault of the mind. But when it clearly sees the tamma, it removes its error, and there's no more poison in the heart. When the mind sees the tamma, abundantly good and released from error, meeting the tamma, it sheds all things that would make it restless. It's mindful, in and of itself, and unentangled. Its love for the kantas comes to an end. Its likes are cured, 
its worries cease, all dust is gone. Even if the mind thinks in line with its nature, we don't try to stop it, and when we don't stop it, it stops running wild. This frees us from turmoil. Know that evil comes from resisting the truth. Evil comes from not knowing. If we can close the door on stupidity, there's ultimate ease. All evil grows silent, perfectly still. All the kantas are suffering, with no pleasure at all. Before I was stupid and in the dark, as if I were in a cave. In my desire to see the tamma, I tried to grab hold of the heart to still it. I grabbed hold of mental labels, thinking they were the heart, until it became a habit. Doing this, I was long enthralled with watching them. Wrong mental labels obscured the mind, and I was deluded into playing around with a kantas. Poor me. Exalting myself endlessly, I went around passing judgment on others, but accomplishing nothing. Looking at the faults of others embitters the heart, as if we were to set ourselves on fire, becoming sooty and burned. Whoever's right or wrong, good or bad, that's their business. Ours is to make sure the heart looks after itself. Don't let unskillful attitudes buzz around it and land. Make it consummate in merit and skill. The result will be peace. Seeing others as bad and oneself as good is a stain on the heart, for one latches on to the kanta that holds to that judgment. If you latch on to the kantas, they'll burn you for sure, for aging, defilement, and death will join in the fray, full of anger and love, obvious faults, worries, sorrows, and fears, while the five forms of sensuality bring in their multifarious troops. We gain no release from suffering and danger, because we hold to the five kantas as ours. Once you see your error, don't delay. Keep constant watch on the inconstancy of sankaras. When the mind gets used to this, you are sure to see the singular tamma, solitary in the mind. Inconstancy refers to the heart as it moves from its labels. When you see this, watch it again and again right at the moving. When all external objects have faded away, the tamma will appear. When you see that tamma, you recover from mental unrest. The mind then won't be attached to dualities. Just this much truth can end the game. Knowing not knowing, that's the method for the heart. Once we see through inconstancy, the mind source stops creating issues. All that remains is the primal mind, true and unchanging. Knowing the mind source brings release from all worry and error. If you go out to the mind ends, you're immediately wrong. Darkness comes from the mind possessive of what's good. This possessiveness is thought up by the mind ends, the mind source is already good when the tamma appears, erasing doubt. When you see the superlative tamma surpassing the world, all your old confused searchings are uprooted and let go. The only suffering left is the need to sleep and eat in line with events. The heart stays tamed near the mind source, thinking, yet not dwelling on its thoughts. The nature of the mind is that it has to think, but when it senses the mind source, it's released from its sorrows, secluded from disturbances, and still. The nature of sankaras when they appear is to vanish. They all decay, none remain. Beware of the mind when you focus on making it refined, for you'll tend to force it to get stuck on the stillness. Get the heart to look again and again at its inconstancy, until it's a habit. When you reach, oh, it will come on its own. Awareness of the heart's song, like a mirage. The Buddha says the corruptions of insight disguise themselves as true when actually they're not. The awareness of mental phenomena that comes on its own is direct vision 
not like hearing and understanding on the level of questioning. The analysis of phenomena, mental and physical, is also not vision that comes on its own. So look. The awareness that comes on its own is not the thought song. Knowing the mind source and mind moments, the source mind is released from sorrow. The mind source's certain automatic knowledge of sankharas, the affairs of change, is not a matter of parading out to see or know a thing. It's also not a knowledge based on labeling in pairs. The mind knows itself from the motion of the song. The mind's knowledge of the motion is simply adjacent mind moments. In fact, they can't be divided. They're all one and the same. When the mind is two, that's called sanya, entangling things. Inconstancy is itself, so why focus on anyone else? When the heart sees its own decayings, it's released from darkness. It loses its taste for them and abandons its doubts. It stops searching for things within and without. Its attachments all fall away. It leaves its loves and hates, whatever weighs it down. It can end its desires. Its sorrows all vanish, together with the weighty cares that made it moan, as if a shower of rain were to refresh the heart. The cool heart is realized by the heart itself. The heart is cool, for it has no need to wander around looking at people. Knowing the mind source in the present, it's unshakable and unconcerned with any good or evil, for they must pass away with all other impediments. Perfectly still, the mind source neither thinks nor interprets. It stays only with its own affairs. No expectations, no need to be entangled or troubled, no need to keep up its guard. Sitting or lying down, one thinks at the source mind, released. Your explanation of the path is penetrating, so encompassing and clear. Just one more thing. Please explain in detail the mind unreleased from the cause of suffering. The cause of suffering is attachment and love, extremely enthralled, creating new states of being without wearying. On the lower level, the stains are the five strings of sensuality. On the higher level, attachment to jhana. In terms of how these things act in the mind, it's all an affair of being enthralled with sankharas, enthralled with all that have happened for a long, long time, seeing them as good, nourishing the heart on error, making it branch out in restless distraction. Smitten by error with no sense of shame, enthralled with admiring whatever it fancies, enthralled to the point where it forgets itself and loses its sense of danger, Enthralled with viewing the faults of others, upset by their evil, not seeing its own faults as anything at all. No matter how great the faults of others, they can't make us fall into hell, while our own faults can take us to the severest hell straight away, even if they aren't very defiling at all. So keep watch on your faults until it comes naturally. Avoid those faults and you're sure to see happiness free from danger and fear. When you see your faults clearly, cut them right away. Don't dawdle or delay or you'll never be rid of them. Wanting what's good without stop, that's the cause of suffering. It's a great fault, the strong fear of bad. Good and bad are poisons to the mind, like foods that inflame a high fever. The tamma isn't clear because of our basic desire for good. Desire for good, when it's great, drags the mind into turbulent thought until the mind gets inflated with evil and all its defilements proliferate. The greater the error, the more they flourish, taking one further and further away from the genuine tamma. This way of explaining the cause of suffering chastens my heart. At first the meaning was tattered and tangled, but when you explained the path, my heart didn't move. At respite, 
still and at peace, reaching an end at last. This is called the attainment of liberation from the Kantas, a tumma that remains in place, with no coming or going, a genuine nature, the only one, with nothing to make it stray or spin. With that, the tale is ended. Right or wrong, please ponder with discernment till you know. Composed by Prabhupada Man, Wat Srapatum, Bangkok.